Want to stay ahead of fraudsters and across the latest scams? At which we helped prevent an estimated £1.8 million in scam losses last year thanks to our Scam Alert newsletter. And each week we provide more information on the latest scam activity, helping protect you, your family and your friends. Stay in the know and avoid falling victim to scammers by joining over 450,000 people already signed up to our free Witch Scam Alerts. To join them, head to witch.co.uk slash scam alert and sign up today. It's a story we know all too well. You think you've nabbed the concert ticket of your wildest dreams, but it turns out it's a cruel summer because you realise you've been scammed or ripped off and that ticket to the big gig has been replaced with a blank space. From event ticket scams to unscrupulous ticket touts, this episode will show you how to avoid losing out when you're buying tickets and you'll be left as a ticket mastermind. I'm Harry Kind. And I'm Grace Farrell. And this is Get Answers for living your best consumer life. When life gives you questions, which get answers. Well, 2024 is another huge year for live events, and these are some of the things we can expect. We're about to go on a little adventure together, and that adventure is going to span 17 years of music. Thereby electing Paris as host city of the Games of the 33rd Olympiad 2024. England make it eight major tournaments in a row and they know in eight months time they'll have the opportunity to go on better than the heartache here 828 days ago. Beautiful, wonderful Glastonbury, thank you for having us. So the eagle-eared amongst you will have heard a bit of Taylor Swift, a little bit of Glastonbury, some Oasis and some big sporting events because this summer we have got the Olympics and the Euros. It's going to be a big year for tickets and so we've actually got to be prepared for all that comes with that. Are you going to any big events this year, Grace? Nothing massive. I'm going to Camp Festival in July, Mm. which I'm really excited about, but no big concerts. Do you know what? I'm just put off by how expensive and hard to get the tickets are. It really is like a whole lot of money for something that actually you can kind of do at home. Taylor Swift's concerts, they're all on Disney+. Plus. It's not quite the same experience, but maybe is it not £200 better an experience? I don't know if I'm really taken in by an expensive ticket like that. But £200 doesn't even scratch the surface for some of these tickets. So I've got two live experts in the studio who can help us out with buying tickets. We've got Witch's own fraud specialist, Faye Lipson. Hiya. And Adam Webb from the Fanfare Alliance. Hello. Thank you both for joining us. Let's start then. I think there'll be a lot of people like myself, really, who maybe haven't been to a live event in a long time. They maybe do a few theatre tickets, but they've not done a gig. There's a whole world out there. Things have changed a lot. You know, we we aren't just buying tickets from a box office. And there's a whole lot of terminology out there. Can we kind of define some terms going on here? Give a bit of an introduction. Adam, what's primary selling, for example? So primary selling is effectively the official ticket service. So usually when an artist is booked to play in a venue by a promoter, the venue will usually have a contract with with a ticket company. And then the promoter, the rest of the allocation, they'll give to other ticket companies. So Ticketmaster will get a share of the tickets, maybe another ticket company as well. So they'll usually be sort of like two or three official ticket outlets, which are the primary ticket companies. And those big companies, you you mentioned AXS there, Ticketmaster, who are the ones that people kind of might recognise? So the biggest probably by quite a way is Ticketmaster, who are owned by Live Nation, who are the world's biggest promoter. Then you've got Sea Tickets, which is probably the second biggest. Actually, they've just been bought by a, a large German promoter called uh, Eventim. Then you've got Eventim, you've got AXS, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones like Dice, uh, Resident Advisor. So there's quite a few in the UK market. And then that's where most people, I suppose, are buying their tickets from, especially if they're newbies to concerts. But there's also a whole other market going on. Can you explain that as well? Uh, You talk about the secondary market. The biggest site by far is Viagogo, which probably most people have heard of. It's probably got about a 95% market share in the UK. And then there's a couple of smaller ones, StubHub, Gigsburg, Ticombo, 
SeatsNet. You'll usually see these sites at the top of Google because they tend to buy search adverts to appear like legitimate primary ticketing sites. Effectively, the model's pretty simple. It's a website. It takes out lots of Google ads. Viagago spends a million on Google ads to appear at the top of search. And then there's lots of people on there selling tickets, the majority of whom are large-scale ticket resellers, touts, brokers, whatever you want to call them. So that's effectively how that model works. So that's the uncapped secondary. And then you've got the capped secondary, which is sort of where the market is moving now in the UK and what we're actually supportive of as a campaign. And that's where you can resell the ticket as a consumer to another consumer capped for the price you paid or less. I mean, that's quite a complex market compared to queuing up at a box office and maybe having some dodgy guys in long coats trying to sell you tickets while you're queuing outside, right? So it's a huge difference. But also one other thing that I I heard you mention there that people might want to know about is is pre-sales. What exactly are those? So pre-sales, I mean, effectively, they're sales that happen before the official sale. Billie Eilish is probably quite a good example. So the poster for Billie Eilish will probably say, tickets on sale Friday morning. What they don't tell you is is that actually there was an album pre-sale. So that'll be People who have pre-ordered Billie Eilish's new album will get a code and the opportunity to get tickets in advance. There's an Amex pre-sale, so Amex card holders can also get in there. This is in Manchester, a co-op pre-sale because she's playing in the co-op venue. And then there's an O2 pre-sale as well. But obviously, what also happens is that touts infiltrate all of these pre-sales, try and get the tickets. And again, it becomes incredibly confusing then, particularly when people are going to Google and they're being sort of signposted into the wrong direction. Well, it sounds like it's a rich territory for touts, but also surely for scammers. Now, Faye, this is something you know quite a lot about. Um, I mean, how serious are problematic at scams? Well, just to take Taylor Swift as an example, Lloyds Bank has just estimated that Taylor Swift fans in the UK have lost around a million pounds just trying to buy tickets for the Eras tour, which hasn't even happened yet in the UK. So that's an enormous problem. And last year it said that it had seen a huge increase in Premiership football ticket scams as well, that um, the number of scams it was seeing reported by its customers had doubled compared with the previous season. So it seems to be enormous and it seems to affect sports and live music equally. I can't believe it's doubled on last year when it was already so prevalent last year. Yes, yeah. It's very prevalent on social media at the moment, as many people may have seen already. So would you say social media is the main platform that these scammers are operating on? Particularly with um, Taylor Swift ticket scams, we're seeing a lot of those coming from Facebook. Ticket scams generally, they tend to come from Facebook, Instagram or X, which is formerly known as Twitter. So yes, very much so. It seems to be social media that's driving this. And what does um, a typical scam look like on, say, Facebook or Instagram or X? So what will typically happen is you'll see on a community page, for example, on Facebook, somebody saying that they've got tickets for Taylor Swift's tour and they can't make it anymore and get in touch if you would like to buy them, essentially. And sometimes that's a scammer using a dummy account and sometimes they've hacked into a genuine Facebook user's account and taken it over for that purpose. And do you think these are are individual people or is it kind of more organised than that? Difficult to say. I mean, these people could be anywhere in the world scamming people like this. Um, and yes, it, there, there could be an organised element. It, it could be an element of bots being involved and posting these posts on a large scale and then somebody stepping in and responding if somebody takes the bait, for example. I suppose if you've got a whole network of people trying to infiltrate people's social media accounts, trying to, you know, basically take them over and then selling them on to people, that would be a great thing to buy someone's Facebook account for would be just to try and con all of their friends and family with a ticket scam, particularly because it's something that you can't really physically hold and check and like a mobile or a, or a laptop. That ticket is something that you kind of have to take their word for. Absolutely. And and one of the things that the hacking of genuine profiles is so insidious for is that, you know, a lot of people that would be quite cautious about buying tickets from a stranger, for example, Mm. if they see tickets advertised by a friend or relative, they're more likely to go for it. So that's why it's so lucrative for scammers to, to access genuine people's accounts to do this. And you almost got caught up in one yourself. Is that right? Yes. So not really connected to which in any way, but separately, I'm a moderator for um, a Facebook 
community page where I live in South East London. And we had um, lots of people posting Taylor Swift ticket adverts. And we realised after a short time that these were scams. And we had to create a filter for the group to block any more posts with uh, t- the words Taylor Swift in them because it was just so prevalent. Gosh, I mean, I have to come clean. I've actually been the victim of one of these scams years ago before oh, no. I started working at which I mean, it's the kind of thing now I look back and I think, oh, God, <laughs> why, why did you? Why did you go along with that? But I really, you know, I just didn't know at the time and I was desperate to get Stevie Wonder tickets he was playing in Hyde Park and so I went onto a Facebook group and I just said is is anyone selling a ticket and sure enough someone it was and um, they you know duped me into transferring the money first because they'd sent a screenshot of the Royal Mail tracking and you know obviously it just turned out to be nothing and I was out of pocket by 80 pounds and it's not just the money it's just the I was so so excited and it's that disappointment it really is just awful. Yeah, it's horrible. And it's especially because you don't want to be, and I'm sure this happens, in the situation where you turn up at Wembley Stadium with a piece of paper which isn't worth anything and get told, well, I'm sorry, you've been conned and you've just spent a load of money on a hotel and you've got the kids out of school to have a once in a lifetime experience. You don't get that when you're scammed for, I don't know, a secondhand van or an iPhone. So you've heard from Taylor Swift fans, is that right, who've been disappointed? That's right. Yes. So we recently helped a victim who really narrowly avoided getting scammed by one of these Facebook posts. So the scammer kind of initially seemed quite genuine and had promised to sell through an official resale app, which I think was Ticketmaster in this case. And they even sent the intended victim an email with the kind of official logo of Ticketmaster on it. And it really looked like the tickets were genuine. But then right at the last moment, the scammer kind of changed the story and said that they would need to be paid by bank transfer because they couldn't quite work out how to use the Ticketmaster app or something like that. And that's when our victim kind of felt a bit uncomfortable and and stopped the transaction. But but they came really close to parting with their money. And I can really see how people that are desperate for these tickets would actually kind of push through those, those uncomfortable feelings and just go for it. And it seems like being asked to give someone money for tickets by a bank transfer is just always a red flag, right? Definitely. It's it's the least protected method. I mean, it really depends who you bank with. But in most cases, that's going to be a relatively less protected method than, than any other method of paying aside from cash, which is also completely unprotected. So how do you avoid getting scammed by a ticket fraudster, especially on social media? What should you be looking out for? Sure. So I think the best case scenario is that you buy through an official reseller. So you're going to want to contact the venue or the the sports club that's relevant and find out who the official reseller is. And that can unfortunately be really expensive and price a lot of people out. So then kind of the next best option is if you get lucky and have friends and family that happen to have tickets to the event that you want to go to, you can buy from them. But as we've said before, you have to be careful about hacked accounts. So you're going to want to call them and check that it's really them that's hosting. It's not really ideal to buy from a stranger. We wouldn't really necessarily recommend it. It's very, very high risk. If you're going to buy a ticket from an individual, the most protected methods of paying would be on a bank card, so credit or debit card, or through PayPal if you select kind of um, buy protection option. And we really suggest kind of avoiding buying from strangers that are asking you to pay by bank transfer. And if you have handed over money to a scammer and you realise that it's a scam, Is it possible to get your money back? Definitely contact your bank or PayPal as relevant, whoever you've paid through. And it may be possible to get the money back. Again, it's going to depend hugely on on which method you've used to pay. Some methods being more protected than others. But it's always, always worth contacting your bank or provider to see if you can get reimbursed. And what's the best way of reporting these kinds of scams? So if you've been scammed, it's recommended that you report it to Action Fraud or to Police Scotland in Scotland. And you can also report posts that you've seen to the individual platforms where they are. So Facebook or Instagram, for example, so that hopefully those profiles are going to get taken down. And guess what? Most of that advice applies to most of the scams as well, doesn't it? Which is easy that you only have to remember one set of things to do most of the time. I mean, Adam, this must be something that you hear about fairly regularly. It must be a concern when you're acting on behalf of fans. Do you hear much about scams? Yeah, all the time. I mean, all the ingredients are there for a scam, aren't they? You've got fear of missing out. You've got the kind of the, you know, in the moment purchase people might want, you know, people making 
decisions in a hurry and under, under sort of slightly pressurised circumstances. There's emotional purchases, you know, you might be buying for your kids or for a special occasion or something. And then, like I said before, it can be quite a confusing market. You know, unfortunately, you've got these sort of platforms like Google, who, again, you've got this sort of dilemma that obviously they're a really trusted brand, but we'd always say don't trust the sites at the top. And then obviously with things like Facebook, I mean, obviously people, because they, it seems that there's an individual human at the end of the transaction. Again, there's an element of trust there as well. And then that ties into something that Witch has been working on for years, campaigning on, which is making sure that social media companies and search engines are responsible for the adverts on their platforms. And they can't just go, oh, well, there's been a scam involving tickets or dodgy sofas or fake goods on our website. But, you know, they just paid the fee to put the advert on. That's something to do with us. No, they have a responsibility to crack down on that. And the online safety bill that's passed, that looks like that will be coming into law and be part of the regulations in the next few years, which is really positive step for fans, particularly, I should think. Well, as we're hearing, it's not just scammers that will have you paying over the odds for tickets. And we're going to be talking more about the ticket resale industry and why Fanfare Alliance thinks it needs to change after this. Last minute escapes in the sun. What is the best airline? Oh, the worst airline. What happens if my flight is delayed or cancelled? Would I be put on a new flight? Or would I be refunded? What if it takes me days to get home? Hmm, benefits of a UK staycation. When life gives you questions, get answers at which.co.uk. This week on Get Answers, we're getting summer ready and talking gig tickets. But in the weeks to come, we'll be getting answers on air fryers, AI and smart tech. So get your questions in now by emailing podcasts at witch.co.uk. And we'll also be putting out a call for questions across the Witch socials. So make sure to follow us. So we've heard a lot about scams, but even in the legitimate market, there are plenty of opportunities for you to to get ripped off to pay more than a ticket was worth when it was sold. Adam, what is going on? How are their companies charging over a thousand pounds for a ticket? Well, those companies will say that they're not selling you the ticket. They're, right. they're just the platform um, the, the facilitating that transaction. The old marketplace excuse. Yeah, so obviously, yeah. Behind, and again, like behind the website sits, I think, something like upwards of 70% of the tickets sold through a platform like Viagogo are from large-scale ticket towns. So people who sell more than 100 tickets a year, at least. So I suppose... Like with so many marketplaces, whether it's, you know, the online marketplaces selling dodgy electrical goods or tickets in this case, I'm sure they say we are providing a marketplace for fans who no longer want their ticket to sell on a ticket that they just can't go to because they've got the doctors that day. But actually, you're saying that these platforms have essentially been infiltrated by massive organised ticket counts. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 these are not fan to fan platforms. These are tout to fan platforms. Adam, paint the picture for us. How do these touts operate? There's not one simple answer. There's lots of different kinds of touts who operate in slightly different ways. But trading standards were given some budget to arrest three groups of touts, two of whom have been convicted. One was about six and a half million pounds worth of tickets. Broadly similar with the second group who were charged and convicted this year. We're waiting on sentencing at the moment. But those groups were basically guilty of four different kinds of fraud fraud offences. So they'd be using aggressive software. So software that would basically help them to infiltrate pre-sales and on-sales, what people might call bots, to you know basically elbow genuine consumers out of the way and, and, and then buy tickets. They'd be using their friends and family and all their credit cards and you sort of multiple identities. They'd be speculatively listing tickets as well. So they'd be listing tickets they haven't purchased, which we think is a massive problem on these websites. So actually a lot of the time the tickets, I mean, for, for a tout, it's sort of perfect because you don't have to risk your own money, but you can list a ticket you don't possess. If someone buys it, then they'll just find a way to go and buy a ticket somewhere to fulfill the order. So you've got people like that. But there's actually a sort of a new generation of ticket touts as well. We, we did a piece with you and yours last year. I guess it's um, sort of a younger generation who moved from selling trainers and using sort of Discord groups. What's Discord, sorry? So it's basically like a sort of a, a group community server. It's used by gamers quite a lot. Right. So basically everyone's sitting on the same server and they're talking and communicating. But with this, you have a bot master 
So the person who has the, the technology to sort of, you know, and the keys to sort of get you into the waiting room and over the wall to get the tickets. You don't need any expertise to do this. You pay up, subscribe. And then when the on sale or the pre-sale happens, they infiltrate the waiting room. They put loads of millions of fake identities up. So it looks like there's like tons of people in the waiting room. So they're blocking off the genuine consumers. And then they effectively jump over the wall, buy what they want to buy, leave, take the fake identities down, and then the real fans can come in. So it's quite a sophisticated kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it sounds like something from The Matrix, honestly. It's, it's, re- it's sort of fascinating. So you end up with, like, like I say, you end up with some people who are targeting certain events. And actually some of them might be, you know, massive fans of music and they've mm. got a good idea of, you know, what's going to be high demand and what isn't, you know, or a, a, a sort of a big artist playing in a small room, that kind of things. And they'll buy, you know, just as many tickets as they can buy either lawfully, they'll buy within the limits or they, you know, some of them will have multiple credit cards and multiple identities and potentially committing fraud. This is serious organised crime then we're talking about. Of course, about. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I mean, obviously there's a couple of impacts. What is obviously if you've got people who are siphoning off huge amounts of ticket from the primary market, it makes it harder to get a ticket. And the second thing is obviously it makes tickets more expensive mm. because they're, you know, they obviously they're trying to sell at a profit and they inflate prices. And I think one of the other knock on effects of that, and this is particularly coming from America, is that because I think they've got a slightly different attitude over there, you're seeing a kind of a, the primary market and the bigger promoters are looking at the secondary market and mm. saying, well, our tickets are too cheap. So we're going to dynamically price the tickets to, you know, to what they are on the secondary market. So we don't think that that's, that's necessarily a very sort of consumer friendly solution. Mm. I think sometimes in this conversation, it's sort of suited a lot of people to be like, oh, it's the bots, as if they're some sort of alien robot (laughs) army. Again, you know, it's just people who have got access to that technology. And again, like I say, it's quite sophisticated. And to combat it, you know, you need the artist, the promoter, the venue, the ticket company. Everyone's got to be sort of lockstep together to sort of fight it. Is this hitting smaller scale venues yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff as well? So even if you've not made it massively bigly, you, you could have all of your tickets being bought yeah, up? It's sort of crazy on these sites. And again, a lot of this might be speculative. I did a bit of research earlier this year. I work on an event called Independent Venue Week, which is basically like a celebration of small venues. There's about sort of 200 odd involved. 70 of those venues had ticket out selling tickets. So quite substantial numbers. And actually when you broke it down, Three touts were probably responsible for like 75% of the listing. One was registered in Buenos Aires, one was in Watford, and the other was was in the Ukraine. And before we get on to some advice that people can use for when they're buying tickets, let's talk about the positives briefly. Live music is essential for artists now, isn't it? And it's a huge part of the UK economy. I know when Taylor Swift goes somewhere, she boosts the GDP of a country basically Mm -hmm. with her, her movements. Live music, we need to protect it, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's huge. I mean, I think it's like the festival season, obviously, small venues, big arena shows and so on. Yeah, I think at every level, it, it, it sort of impacts on communities around the UK. Obviously, we're really good at it. Just, I mean, the number of festivals, for instance, is, is pretty amazing, really, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. For artists, obviously, that's the thing that they really, really love is playing before an audience, particularly compared to the kind of more digital world where you're sort of removed, that human element's removed. I think that sort of direct contact is what a lot of people get quite thrilled by, I think. Well, if you want to try and get some of that direct contact, how should people be approaching getting tickets? Say there's a particular artist that they want this summer, they know sales are coming up, what should they do? So the four things I would do if I was looking to buy tickets for a show is one, I'd do my research and preparation. So I'd I'd probably go to the artist's website and I would try and find out who are the official primary ticketing companies um, for, for that show that you want to attend. Um, I would look into pre-sales and sign up to any of those that might be applicable. So it might be buying the new album or registering for a mailing list, or it might be that you're a subscriber to a certain mobile phone company already or something like that. But, you know, there might be some opportunities to get in early. I definitely wouldn't trust search engines because they're probably going to signpost you to unofficial places. And then I just wouldn't panic. Again, most shows actually don't sell out. So there'll probably be an opportunity to buy a ticket sort of closer to the date. Adam, Faith, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can people find out about your campaign and, and if they're interested, kind of get behind it? So our website is fanfarealliance.org. There's a few bits of guidance up there for consumers. There's lots of things for the music industry to do. And again, that's one of the things that we're really trying to do is get more artists and venues and ticket companies to sort of do some proactive things. Because again, it's, it's very easy to sit back and say, I don't like ticket touts, but unless you do something about it, nothing changes. Taylor, if you're listening, just give us a call. We're, we're always here. <laughs> or podcast at witch.co.uk. Faye, Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, if you want to read more on how to protect yourself from scams, we'll put a link to Faye's articles in the show notes. Next time on Get Answers, we're taking on the mighty air fryer, the cooking appliance that refuses to go out of fashion. But just what is so good about them? And are they really worth the money? To get your air fryer questions answered by our experts, email us at podcasts at witch.co.uk or say hello on social media. We're at Witch UK on all the main channels. And of course, we would love it if you could leave us a rating or a review. It would be really helpful in showing your support and it gets us recommended to new listeners. Today's Good Answers was presented by me, Harry Kind, alongside Grace Farrell, produced by Rob Lilly-Jones and Adrian Bradley, and recorded by James Rowe, and edited by Eric Breer. And thanks again to our wonderful guests, Adam Webb and Faye Lipson. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Like listening to podcasts just like this one from the team at Witch? Well, we've got some good news. All our podcasts are now available to listen to on YouTube and YouTube Music. So whether you like listening to Get Answers, Witch Shorts or Witch Money, all episodes can now be listened to directly on YouTube or through the YouTube Music app. To find them, just search for the podcast you'd like to listen to. YouTube's additional functionality also means that you can now read along with subtitles as you listen. Don't panic though, all which podcasts are still available to listen to elsewhere too. So wherever you listen, we'll see you soon.